Well, it's a, a, pl a pleasure to be back here live. I used to give lots of talk to engineering physics and mechanical engineering students before COVID. For a few years, I didn't see any student. So it's a pleasure to be back here. And uh, the talk today is not, it's, I'll give many examples of ingenious solutions to seemingly impossible problems. Uh, actually, not from my experience, from exp actually nothing to do with any of the companies I was involved in starting. But uh, even before I get into this talk, I want to explain uh, why it is important not to be too quick to judge if a problem is impossible. Because if you want to succeed in the high-tech business, especially in North America, you know, you can't succeed by outworking the people in Asia, okay? Because to be fair, in Asia they work harder than we do, <laughs> okay? So the only way to succeed is come up with really novel ideas. And the trick is selecting the idea. Because if you select an idea that it's obviously that it's doable, everybody else thought about it before you. Okay, because if it's doable, there is a need for it. Some people thought about it before you and probably already started companies before you. Now, if you select an idea which looks impossible, but you know that it's possible, then you, you have a good chance to have a winning company. Now, if you, but if your judgment is a bit off, if you select an idea which is impossible, and you think it's possible, but you are wrong. It's really impossible, then you lost a lot of time and the investors lost a lot of money, <laughs> okay? So basically, the successful companies, uh, at least in the West today, are on this edge that you believe it's possible, everybody else thinks it's not possible, but you know that there is some way around it, you don't give up and you succeed and you have a a, you have a lead over competition. B, you can get some patents or IP. So the combination, if it's other people thought it's impossible and you found a way to make it possible, gives you some patent portfolio. And that's a good recipe to succeed. So in most of my past companies, we got into things like that, that people, things that some of them people tried before and gave up. And we said, just, just a minute, don't give up so quickly. It's not impossible. So before I get into the actual lecture, I want to give you, to remind you of some very classic examples. Uh, the most successful company in mobile phones in the world, or one of the most successful, was uh, RIM, Research in Motion. They made the BlackBerry. And people always ask them, why can't we surf the web? With the BlackBerry, I said, well, it'll eat up the battery in no time. You can't put a battery, that's what the engineers at RIM said. Can't put a battery big enough in a phone uh, it'll drain the battery. And Steve Jobs was faced the same problem with the iPhone, but he told his engineers, he was very driven, he told his engineers, if there is not enough room for a battery big enough, why don't we shrink everything else in the phone until we fill most of the phone with one big battery? And that's how iPhone made a phone which serves the web not because of new technology, because of squeezing everything else until almost all the volume of the phone was a battery and it worked. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is kind of a classic example that other people said, no, it's impossible. Some guy said, let's think about it. It doesn't violate any law of physics. Okay, so maybe it is possible. Okay, so, so you have to adopt this way of thinking not to rush to declare something impossible because all the papers or other people said it's impossible, okay? And uh, to encourage this way of thinking, I want to present a bunch of clever solutions in different fields to problems that everybody declared, what's the point, it's impossible, but some guy said, no, 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 just a minute, let's think about it. And, and I'm not talking only about things which just somebody solved by 20 years of very hard work. Like Kao, the inventor of fiber optics, he improved the transparency of glass fibers by 10 to the power of 200. Now, there's nothing in history of mankind which was improved by 10 to the power of 200. You know, people talk about computing power progress and all these things. Nothing comes close to what Kao did. You know, uh, they, at the time, the fibers were losing uh, 
hundreds of dBs per kilometer, or and dB is a logarithmic unit, or thousands of dB per kilometer, and he brought it down to a few dBs per kilometer, which, but, but he did it by very hard work, not by one brilliant idea. So for this, you really have to be clever and driven. But many, many things were solved by a single clever idea, in spite of the fact that everybody assumes it's impossible. So let me list very quickly about 10 such ideas that are not related. Just to, to show you, you shouldn't be quick to say, oh, no, 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 that's impossible. So first idea is when you have a bulletproof glass in a car, okay, it's, it is not a perfect solution because if somebody is trying to kill you, you are in the car, you know, they can shoot at the window, one shot, another shot, another shot, until finally the bullets go through the glass. Now, you cannot shoot back because, because you are in a bulletproof ca car. So, obviously, the dream of all security forces is a bulletproof glass that the people in the car can shoot back. So, it's a one-way uh, bulletproof glass. Nobody can shoot in, but you can shoot out. And again, people said, how can this be possible? If it stops bullets, it stops bullets both ways, right? <laughs> because uh, bulletproof glass is made by layers of laminations, polymer glass, polymer glass, and you make a stack of laminations until it's thick enough and strong enough to stop a bullet. Typically, it's like one inch thick, okay? But, so everybody says, if your bullet cannot go in, how can it go out? But there was one clever guy who says, just a minute. It doesn't have to be so, and he developed the bulletproof grass, which is now used by a lot of security forces, that allows the people in the vehicle to shoot out and nobody can shoot in. And I'll show you how it works. And it, so what he did, he said, let's make a stack, but from dissimilar materials. And what he did, he laminated polycarbonate with acrylic. He made a special adhesive and laminated, say, half-inch polycarbonate and half-inch acrylic. Now, acrylic shatters very easily. Acrylic is like a plexiglass. You know, you, you know what I mean by acrylic, plexiglass. It's hard. It shatters easy. It's actually very hard if you try to compress it. It gets harder and very hard to compress, but it shatters easily. Polycarbonate is opposite. Polycarbonate is soft. Polycarbonate is what is known as Lexan. You know, you make this helmets out of it, windows. So polycarbonate doesn't shatter at all. It's quite soft, but it's very high impact resistance. That's why you make helmets and other safety things out of it. So he laminated polycarbonate with acrylic. So if the bullet comes from the acrylic side, the acrylic is backed by the polycarbonate and doesn't and cannot break. So I'll just show you a quick video, which just a few seconds, instead of explaining it. Okay, uh, now I have to switch here uh, HDMI. Uh, that, that be okay, oh, yeah. Oh, it's already set up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and let's see. Let's play this video. Okay, and the third one down. yeah, Windows Media Player, that should work. Uh, oh, yeah, it's playing. Just make it full screen. Here. Okay, it can uh, sound. I don't know how you adjust the volume here. Uh, oh, here, here, I got it, but it's already maximum. Yeah. Okay, here, here, I got it, I got it. No, I just it here already. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. And the more the acrylic presses, the harder it becomes. This flattens out the bullet like a coin and slows it down. Enough for the flexible polycarbonate, acting as a shock absorber, to stop it in its tracks. Now here's where the magic happens. When you shoot from the inside, it's all reversed. The bullet pierces the polycarbonate layer, which is meant to be a shock absorber, not a frontline defender. When the bullet reaches the acrylic, the acrylic doesn't compress and get hard because there's no polycarbonate to compress against. So the bullet doesn't flatten, and shoots right on through. Bad okay. guys, look out. Press okay, the anyway. The acrylic against the polycarbonate, and the more the acrylic compresses, the harder it Okay, that just repeats itself. That's, that's good. Okay, let's... Okay, stop it. Anyway, you got the idea. Okay, uh, cancel it. 
So anyway, uh, seems a very, very simple solution, right? And people in the whole world for years, uh, bulletproof grass is 100 years old. So for 100 years, people automatically assume there is no way to make it unidirectional. And, and one clever guy said, just a minute. <laughs> Okay, by the way, it happened to him by fluke. You know, he did some experiments and he kind of noticed something when he laminated asymmetric glass. But, you know, the cleverness is to understand the fluke, to understand what you saw. Because as many discoveries were done by fluke, but the reason it happened to these guys and not to everybody else, because they were smart enough to understand what they saw and the potential of the mistakes they saw. Because, uh, you know, if you look, especially in material science, about half the discoveries in material science is somebody observed something strange. Anybody else would have ignored it, but somebody very clever and observant say, just a minute, there's something interesting here, uh, including the latest Nobel Prizes, right, in uh, carbon and, you know, the new forms of carbon and so on. It's just clever observations of people. Everybody else saw the same, but didn't stop and think what it means. Okay, it's just an example, seemingly impossible problem, very trivial solution. So let me run through a whole bunch of other things like this. As I said, the, the ideas are not related, but they just show you not to rush to judge. Something is impossible. So here is a, a very, very simple thing. Uh, the, when you make nuts, you have to, let me just do this, send to all. Uh, it's coming, okay. Yeah, okay, so so when you, when you make nuts, you have something called a tap, okay. This is, this is called a tap, I mean, you've seen it in your courses in the shop. Uh, you, you have the nuts which are punched out, they have to go on the tap, the tap threads on, and it's fine if you want to make one nut. But what if you make, make millions of nuts in a factory? So you have to reverse the machine. You tap one nut, then you have to reverse the machine, and then put this nut away, put another nut on. Now, as everybody who works with machines knows, if you have to reverse a machine, it's a lot of waste of time. If you can make a machining process where everything goes in one direction, you can run faster and faster, you don't have to stop and decelerate and accelerate. And this is actually the basis of many, many high-speed production processes that somebody figured out how to do it without reversing or stopping. So for many, many years, I would say hundreds of years, people thought about it, can you tap nuts without having to reverse a machine? So of course you can make a very long tap, but no matter how long it is, eventually it will fill up with nuts. <laughs> okay, and then what? You have to hold the tap somewhere. So what do you do? It fills up with nuts, and then what? So I'll give you a second to think about it, because maybe one of you will have an idea how to do a tap which is driven at full torque, and somehow miraculously the nuts can come off. Okay, so anyway, yes? Can you design the thread that cut it to be in, threaded in one direction and then the threads that pull it off in the other direction? So like one way is counterclockwise, the other way is clockwise, so once it gets to the end and it's threaded, the same motion will pull it off the end? But then it's not a normal thread. There are such threads. You can cross-thread. Mm -hmm. So the same motion will move the nut one way or the other way, depending how you started it. Mm -hmm. But the nut will also be threaded in a strange way. So, so, but it's true. It's like actually possible because there is such a thing as a cross thread, like the two threads cross, and then the and the same direction of rotation can move the nut this way or this way, depending how you start it. If you pull or push, but you have a strange nut. But it's a thought. Okay, it's good. It's good thinking. But anyway, the, the solution is so trivial that everybody who sees this is embarrassed that they didn't think of it. All, all what you do is this, all what you need is this device. Uh, what it is, it's a tap which is bent like this, has the same nut on it, okay, and you put it in a bent channel. I don't know if you see it clearly here, yeah. And you close it, okay, for good measure, okay, and now, this thing rotates, so this thing is tapping, 
it rotates like this, and as the nuts get tapped, they flow up on this curved rod, and then they fly out, and this is sitting in a bucket, and all the nuts fly out and fill the bucket. <laughs> okay? So you, so you don't even need a conveyor, you just need a bucket, you fill in the nuts at the bottom, and the bucket fits up with tapped nuts. <laughs> okay? Clever, eh? <laughs> but uh, I'm not just showing it to you for the cleverness, which is indeed clever, but it looks like such a seemingly impossible problem. When you present it like this, you say you have a tap, you have a nut, you have to make a normal thread, the nuts have to move up on the tap. It seems, why are we wasting time? There is no solution, <laughs> right? But there is, <laughs> okay? So let's go through a whole bunch of other things like that, uh, some in historical context. I mean, this is maybe not a problem that the whole world was thinking about it, but I can show you l later on a few minutes I'll show you problems that the whole world was thinking about it for a hundred years. It's not just one guy had a problem making nuts. <laughs> it's a problem, same with the smartphones, but there are problems that a hundred years people worked on it, and some guy came and said, it's trivial. <laughs> okay, so I don't expect any of us to always come up with such brilliant solution, but I do expect all of us not to be too quick to say, forget it, it's not possible, <laughs> okay? Because the moment you say, let's look at it, let's try some ideas, the moment you believe it doesn't violate any laws of physics, maybe it is possible. That's already a big step, <laughs> not to write off good ideas. Okay, here is another idea. Everybody knows that an electromagnet attracts steel and doesn't attract aluminum and copper. You know that from childhood, so if I have a, have a piece of steel, an electromagnet, this tap is made of steel, so, okay, that's what you've seen, okay. But, can you make an electromagnet which attracts aluminum, copper, brass, uh, non-magnetic metals? So, again, the first thought is, why are we wasting time? You just said non-magnetic metals, right? Non-magnetic metals means metals that not, will not be attracted to a magnet, so why are we wasting time? But here is an electromagnet, here is a, here is a piece of aluminum, here is a piece of copper. There is no trickery here. I mean, you can say that is maybe steel inside, but this is real copper, this is real aluminum, okay? And... Okay, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I, I was trained in electrical engineering, so this especially blew my mind, <laughs> because, you know, you, you have a set of thoughts, of ideas about electromagnetism, you exactly understand magnetic fields, you understand uh, ferromagnetism, you know, you understand the diamagnetism, things repelling from a magnet. You also understand that actually a piece of conducting metal, which is not ferromagnetic, will be repelled from electromagnet. Can, can somebody explain why would a piece of aluminum or copper actually be repelled from electromagnet, which operates on AC? This is plugged in, so it operates on AC. So can somebody explain? Yes, please. S sorry, say it again. <laughs> no, but I, I'm not sure I understood you. But uh, can can somebody name the phenomena which causes a piece of non-ferromagnetic metal to be repelled from an electromagnet powered by AC? Yes, correct, because electromag very good. Electromagnet induces eddy currents. Eddy currents uh, try to cancel the magnetic field which created them, and, uh, the, and because of that, they are pushed away, and this is called what law? What's the name of the law which says that it will try to kill the magnetic field and therefore repelled? What's the name of this law? That's the most fundamental law in electromagnetism there is. 
Yes? Land's law. You should, all of you should have known that. Shame, shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, Land's law is a law used to develop the most important intuition in electromagnetism. Right? Without understanding Land's law, you don't have any intuition why things work in electromagnetism, like motors and other things. It's a very important law to understand uh, at a deep level. But now, this electromagnet is actually strange. When you look at it a bit closer, one end of it behaves as a proper electromagnet should and actually repels aluminum. So this end, if I put it here, by Lenz law and because of eddy current, will repel the aluminum and push it away. See, you can see the copper. Copper is actually lifting. The steel is attracted, but the copper is repelled and pushed away. So one end actually works like a proper electromagnet, and if I try to pick up the copper, of course it repels it. But the other end works the opposite. If I put the copper, it's actually attracted. What well, I put it off center, it's attracted to the center. And if I if I lift it, it picks it up. It even picks it up from a distance. So that's even weirder. I have an electromagnet where one end behaves like I expect, the other end behaves the opposite than I expect, and you can see both ends. So that's even weirder. <laughs> okay. Now, this, this is actually a, not a trivial thing to understand how it works. I'll give you a quick explanation, but if you don't fully understand it, you have to open some books and read. I used to teach a course at UBC in uh, mechatronics and mechanical engineering. And at the end of the course, the course dealt with actuators, with things like this. At the end of the course, I showed it to the students. And I said, anybody who can explain how this works is exempt from the final exam. <laughs> you, you don't have to come to the final exam, you get an A. <laughs> Nobody, of course, ever <laughs> could explain it. Uh, so. In order to make you curious, I'll show you what's inside this electromagnet. And I leave you with a question to figure out how it works. Because A, it takes too long to explain. B, you should develop curiosity. So that's the inside of this electromagnet. It's a piece of laminated steel with a coil. The coil is missing. One end is just regular steel. And the other end has a copper ring. Has a copper ring surrounding the middle. Okay, so the end, which it doesn't have a copper ring, behaves normal, repels by, by Lenz law, repels copper, and alumi repels copper and aluminum. The end, which has a copper ring, attracts everything, steel, copper, and aluminum. Okay, so now I leave it to you to figure it out why. Okay, <laughs> but again, it's a, an example of something that... If somebody came to you and said, we need to make some magnetic pickup, which picks up some things and moves them, like a robot, a robot which has to pick up pieces and put them in a conveyor, then everybody would say, well, if pieces are steel, it's trivial. Any electromagnet will pick it up, put it. But if somebody says, just a minute, the pieces are actually aluminum, then you say, well, can't be done. But all what you have to do is add this copper ring, and suddenly the electromagnet picks up aluminum pieces. So it's a very good example not to rush and say, we're wasting time, can't be done. And for those who are curious, try to figure out how it works. Okay, that was second example. How are we doing on time? Okay, okay. Let's go, let's run quickly so a few other examples, including ones which bothered people for a hundred years. So let's go here. Uh, okay, let's go back to HDMI. Okay, HD, oops. Why doesn't it do? And send to all. And let's go to here. So I'll show you two problems which bothered people a lot of years. Okay. Uh, when you have a simple lens, uh, the lens ha has what's called color aberrations, okay, or chromatic aberration is a scientific name. And the chromatic aberration comes from the fact that in a prism, as you can see, in a prism, if you look at the top, 
the shorter wavelengths is bent more than the longer wavelengths. Same reason you get a rainbow, right? And if the prisms are made from different materials, the amount of this effect, this effect is called chromatic dispersion. The effect of chromatic dispersion depends on the material. Uh, some low index glass will have less chromatic dispersion, some high index glass like diamond will have a huge chromatic dispersion. That's why diamond looks so colorful. When you, okay? But they all have the same direction of chromatic dispersion. The short wavelength, the blue, will always be bent more. And as the bottom picture shows, a lens can be visualized as just two prisms stuck together. Right? It's kind of an intuitive way to understand what a lens does. So if you stick two prisms together, it will focus the light. But it will have chromatic aberration because the short wavelengths will be bent more. So if you make like a telescope from simple lenses, you'll get color fringes around the image, like when you look at a cheap binocular cheap telescope. Now, this problem did actually occupy the best minds for a couple of hundred years. And the main reason for that was the British Navy. Because the British, for hundreds of years, dominated the oceans. Okay? And uh, to dominate the oceans, you need two, sh two things, guns and a telescope. Mm -hmm. you, you look for your competitors and you sink them with the guns. <laughs> okay? But if they... If they can see you before you can see them, you are in trouble, because maybe they will think you. So you need a very good telescope and very good guns. The good guns is a separate story, <laughs> but some other time. But the good telescopes was hard to make because this chromatic aberration blurs the image. So this is a problem that was worse to the British Empire a lot. Okay? The better telescopes, the same as... Uh, chronometer and other navigational aid meant fortunes for the British Empire. So that was really a problem which occupied the best minds in the world for at least a hundred years. And people said, well, no matter what we do, we can make a lens from a material which has less chromatic aberration, but no matter what we do, any combination of glasses, the chromatic aberration will always be the same direction. We can't cancel it. Right? Because it was clearly that the solution is some cancellation scheme that you can maybe put a few glasses together and somehow cancel it out. And that's how it's done today. Okay? But people said, well, it doesn't matter. There is no material on airs which has reverse dispersion. By the way, a grating has reverse dispersion, as you know, right? A diffraction. But in those days, they didn't have gratings yet. And they didn't, even if they had them, they didn't understand how you can make a lens from a grating, what's called a zone plate. You can actually make a diffractive lens, a lens made from a grating, and it will have opposite dispersion. And you can actually print a grating on a lens and cancel its dispersion, but this is 20th century technology. But at the time we're talking about, uh, it's basically even before gratings existed, and people didn't understand that. So, so all the materials known to man, all the glasses known to man, had dispersion in the same direction. So how do you cancel out the dispersion? So sounded again one of those problems, why waste your time? OK. So any ideas? Yes? Can you use mirrors? Yes. If you use mirrors, you don't have these problems. And indeed, telescopes were made of mirrors because of this problem. But a mirror has to be made at least four times more accurate than a lens. Uh, it may not be obvious why. Because in a lens, the power of the lens comes from the difference because the index of refraction and air so glass is index, let's say, 1.5. So the power of the lens is the shape times the delta index. Okay? So basically, if you have some error, the error will show up n minus 1 times the shape error. Because if the lens is air and it's inside air, it does nothing. So the power comes from the difference in the refractive index. So 
basically the the because the difference between the lens material and air is half, the error will be halved. In a mirror, the error will double. Because if a mirror moves, say, quarter lambda, the reflected wave moves half lambda because it's double pass. Okay, so here one micron error will be two micron error on the wave front of the light. So the, if you want to make a lens or a mirror, the mirror has to be four times more accurate to, get, to do the same job. And that's the reason it was harder to do it with mirrors. But indeed, for the reasons we just said, astronomical telescopes were mainly mirror-based because people couldn't make perfect lenses in big sizes, but they could, had better chance to make a mirror. But if you wanted, you have a given precision available to you, a mirror was four times harder. Do you understand this calculation of 4x between lens and mirror? Anyway, you can think about it later. But, okay, so what can you do? So anyway, again, the solution is totally trivial. If you make, a, instead of this lens, which is a positive lens, okay, it brings the light together, if you make a negative lens, a negative lens is like two prisms which are head to head. So say, so this was a positive lens simplified. The positive lens was simplified by two prisms which bring the light this way. But a negative lens which looks like this can be simplified by two prisms tip to tip which brings the light this way, okay? So a prism like this, of course, will tilt the blue light more. So this will be blue and this will be red, okay? And this here, blue will be the inside. This will be red and this will be blue. So if you put a positive lens and a negative lens together, you'll get cancellation because this will bend the blue more this way and this will bend the blue more the other way. But if you make both lenses of the same material and you reach cancellation, there is no optical power. The lens does nothing. Because if I take this and I put next to it this, so this has perfect color cancellation but all what happens, it does nothing. It's like a piece of glass. <laughs> okay, but, and so people must have thought of that, but they said, okay, if we cancel the aberration, we cancel the effect of the lens. But then some people said, just a minute, here is a trick. You make a, you can make one lens much stronger than the other by making it from a different glass. Because there are many types of glass. So you make the weaker lens from a glass which has a much more chromatic aberration. So what you do is you take the strong lens from one glass and you put a weak lens, and the weak lens is a negative lens which has the opposite, or this could be flat. So this lens has much less optical power because it has less curvature, it has less optical power, but you make it from a glass which has very high aberration. So the aberrations will cancel, but the optical power will not. So if light comes in here, it will separate, it will be the blue, and when it comes back out, it will, blue will go this way, so this is blue, this is red, so they'll start from one point, add in one point, but there will be net optical power. So actually the direction coming out will be more like this. So there will be a focusing effect and cancellation of chromatic aberration. Because you have actually, uh, you have to satisfy two conditions, certain magnification and cancellation of aberration. But you have many parameters. The parameters you have, you have, you have different radiuses available and different types of glass available. So you have a lot more degrees of freedom than constraints. Like in general, if the degrees of freedom matches the constraints, a solution is possible. If, the, if you have less degrees of freedom than constraints, by luck it can resolve itself, but most likely not. But if you have a lot more degrees of freedom than constraints, it should be possible to solve it. Okay? So anyway, so this is how it was solved. 
And uh, again, it was surprising that this took so many years. So the first guy who solved it is a fellow by the name of Doland. There's some dispute who really solved it, but he's usually credited with it. And this was 1759. But remember, lenses existed from for 2,000 years. The Romans already had some simple lenses, like glassmakers in Venetia could make some lenses and mirrors. So lenses existed for hundreds of years. And this problem was solved first in 1759, which sounds like many, many years ago. But the problem existed at least 100 years before. OK? OK, one other example, and then we'll quit. I leave time for questions. OK, so here is another example. Uh, about in 1820 or something, yeah, something in early, early 1800s, I don't remember the year, there was some French scientist when he, by the name of Comte, and he wanted to give an example that there are some things that no matter how we study, we'll never understand, we'll never know. And the example he gave, he said, look, we'll never know what the stars are made of, no matter how much we study. So people said, makes sense. How can we get to the stars? You know, that was 200 years ago. It's a good example. We'll never know what stars are made of. What is surprising is that within 10 years, everybody knew what all the stars are made of. <laughs> okay? And that is really amazing because it was such a wild thought. How can you know what the sun is made of? How can you know what the stars are made of? And of course, you know the answer is spectroscopy, right? And you learned uh, spectroscopy. So both Kirchhoff and Bunsen uh, realized that uh, each element has a spectral signature, either in emission spectroscopy or in absorption spectroscopy, okay? So, uh, I mean, this is absorption spectroscopy, the top one. It has shows the dark lines, but you can have emission or absorption spectroscopy. And actually, the first guy who understood it is Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer was manufacturing optical glass and played with gratings. And he understood that grating separates the light into color and work like a prism, but he understood you can get even higher resolution. Because in a prism, you are limited in the dispersion by the index of dispersion, which is limited. You only, dis you know, between blue and red, you only have like a degree difference in dispersion. But when you make a grating, the denser you rule the grating, the more dispersion you get. There is no limit. So you can separate closely spaced wavelengths. And Fraunhofer is the first one who played with gratings and understood that. And, and Bunsen and Kirchhoff, it's the same Bunsen who made the Bunsen burner you have in your chemistry labs. And it's the same Kirchhoff from Kirchhoff's law in electrical engineering. They immediately understood the potential of gratings and made simple spectrometers. And then they looked at all the elements. They put in hydrogen, oxygen, helium, and they saw each one has spectral lines. And then, of course, they pointed the spectrometer at the sun, and they saw immediately what's in the sun. And within a few years, they analyzed the composition of all the stars. So you can see on the right-hand side the spectral lines of all the stars, and it tells you what they are made of. So within about 10 years of somebody said conclusively as an example of something we'll never figure out, we'll never figure out what the stars are made of, within 10 years people knew what all the stars are made of, at least the ones which are radiant, not uh, dead, like sun and other radiant. Okay? So here is an example that what the stars are made of is something that people dreamt about for a thousand years. Because everybody was curious, you know, what they, well, what's inside the sun, what are the stars made of, okay? And after a thousand years of dreaming, the solution was so simple as scratching a few lines on a piece of glass and looking at the sun, and you know what it's made of, okay? So anyway, I can go on with many other examples, but you, you get the message, okay, that you don't have to... Oh, yeah, well, I'll show you one other quick example for one minute. And then I'll leave time for questions. Uh, there is a lot of work done in vacuum. And sometimes you have to transmit rotary motion into a vacuum chamber. 
Okay, so everybody says, well, we can make some seal. You know, we can seal with an O-ring, with rubber, and trans but these seals are not perfect, and in high vacuum systems, like they use a triumph here, there's some high vacuum systems, all the seals eventually leak. So people always wondered, can you transmit rotary motion through a solid wall without a seal, without having a hole in the wall? And again, uh, people look at it and say, either it's a solid wall or it isn't. If it is a solid wall, <laughs> you, know, you can't put a shaft through it. If you put a shaft through it, it's not a solid wall. But it turns out the solution is totally trivial. All what you need is part of that wall to be able to flex. So if you have a solid wall and part of it is thin, and the thin part can flex, you can transmit rotary motion and... Since it's kind of a bit mind-boggling, I made a model to show it. So let me go back to that. Send to all. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so this is how simple it is. You have a wall which can flex. Here, this wall, you can see it can flex a bit. So when I turn one crank, the wall flexes, and the crank on the other side turns, and you can see that all the wall has to do is flex. That shaft doesn't rotate. That shaft is anchored to the wall. It doesn't rotate. It just has to wobble like this. And if it wobbles, it can transmit the rotary motion. Now watch carefully. The shaft doesn't rotate. See, there is a red marker actually to show it. There is a red pin on the shaft here. Watch the red pin. You can see the shaft doesn't rotate. It just wobbles. Okay, and because the wall is thinned out to be flexible, the wobble can transmit the rotation, as you can see in the other end. Okay, is it clear or? Okay, good. Again, another seemingly impossible problem, completely trivial solution. It's not the only solution, by the way. There is about a dozen solutions, how to transmit rotary motion through a solid wall. Okay, I'll cut it off here because you got the message, okay? <laughs> It's not to give up so too quickly, <laughs> okay? And we have 15 minutes left, so I'll take questions either about the talk or about anything you may want to ask me. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I have a question that I think might be relevant to a lot of people here because many people like me have actually worked for companies that you've founded. Ah, thank um, you. <laughs> and so I guess like you've talked a bit about you know, the process of kind of coming up with a lot of these ideas. So you choose impossible, not too impossible, degrees yes. of being ready with constraints, but just having a flu. And I guess like... You found a lot of companies, you've got a lot of patents, and so you've obviously come up with a lot of ideas. Like, where did these ideas sort of come from for you? Like, were they flukes? Were they like aha moments? Was it like long periods of consultation? Like, what? what okay, so, sort of okay so let me tell you the bad news. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the, the bad news is that you need some basic knowledge uh, to come up with ideas because you have to know very quickly what will work, what will not work. And unfortunately, there is in the current education system, uh, the people don't end up with enough knowledge to come up with enough good ideas. And that's a low, I don't get into this whole topic, that's a separate topic, because in the old days, there was no, no internet, no smartphone, no video games, so people were bored. When people grew up, they were all bored, so they were bored, they read books, and slowly found what interests them. And, and then they got fascinated by certain fields and acquired a lot of knowledge in this field. And if you read the biographies of every inventor and so on. As kids, they always got fascinated by something, read a lot of books. Now, today, nobody's bored, okay? If you're bored, you just turn on the computer and look at YouTube or something. <laughs> nobody's bored, nobody reads books, nobody has the time to find out what really interests them, and nobody has the time to acquire the knowledge. So that acquiring of the knowledge comes later in life. Okay, because you read about many people who started companies at age 20 and brilliant people with immensely potent ideas, but a hundred years ago, people at age 20 already had this knowledge that people today have at age 40. And the reason for that, they were bored from age five, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so if you're bored 15 years, by age 20, they had a lot of knowledge and they experimented, and today, 
I'm not saying people are dumber. I mean, the intelligence is distributed the same way ever since creation or whatever, right? So I'm not saying people today are dumber. The distribution is the same. Some are smarter, some are dumber. But the smartest people a thousand years ago were equally smart to the smartest people today. I don't think there's any change in intelligence from generation to generation. There is a change in the database, what you carry in your head. Okay, and uh, people in the old days carried more in their head because they had no internet to rely on. And there, and there is something important in coming up with ideas to carry a lot of stuff in your head, not in the internet. Because as somebody explained, to invent is to just put two known things together. But if you don't know anything, there's nothing to put together. <laughs> so basically, you have to carry the thing simultaneously in your head. And then they kind of meet in your head and they, aha. Uh -huh. But if one idea is in this page on the internet and one idea is in that page of the internet, you never see the two ideas together. Okay? So the problem of inventing is lots of things floating in your head and you can combine things, hey, this can work, right? But if you, you know, the current generation says, I don't need to know anything, I can always look it up. But you cannot look it up to create, come up with a new idea because you need many things floating in your head combining. Okay, and that is a problem. And so because of that, maybe in software it's different because people had brilliant ideas at a young age. But in hardware, and especially in material science, mechanical engineering, hardware, people get the good ideas much later in life just because they don't have the knowledge in their heads which has to combine to the ideas. So, so, the, so the bad news is you have to give it time. Uh, don't, don't be frustrated that you haven't invented anything yet. You're graduating in a couple of years and you have no great invention yet. <laughs> don't, don't let this frustrate you. This is maybe possible in software, but not possible in other fields because you just have to build up that knowledge. Any other questions? Yes. I'm going to take a step back from what Alistair said. Um, in order to find a, or in order to solve a problem, you have to have a problem to solve. Yes. Is there anything that you found has driven the like problems that you've gone out to solve in your life thus far? Oh, the world. First of all, you don't have to have a problem because there's two ways to approach it. One way is to ask people, what's your problem? You meet people from different industries and you ask them, what's your biggest problem? And you think about it. Is it solvable or not? But there's another way to invent. And that's what Steve Jobs said about himself, that he likes to think up of product people don't even know they would like. <laughs> okay. Because you just look around and say, wouldn't it be nice to have this and this gadget? It's not a known problem because nobody ever felt the need for it. But you know, if you came up with this gadget, people will like it. So strangely enough, uh, not everything you invent is to solve a problem. It's to, it's a lot of the stuff you invent, you know, when the laser was invented, it was named a cure looking for a disease. <laughs> because nobody really needed a laser. It was amazing, <laughs> but people said, what do I need it for? It could make a hole in a laser blade. That was a demo of the first laser. But people said, so what is it good for? Right? It took many years before the first application of laser came out. So, so some of the inventions don't actually solve a known problem, but it is easier in terms of making money if you can solve a known problem that somebody told you it has. So basically, if you want for the advancement of science or technology, you don't have to solve a known problem. The, many of the biggest inventions were not to solve a problem. Somebody came across it, and then it became a big thing. But if you need the money, you want to get money quickly, it's a lot simpler. If somebody tells you this industry has a huge problem, if you solve it, you'll be rich. <laughs> a mouse step store, right? So it depends. So you don't not always need a problem, but financially life is simpler. If you need investors and you tell them that you have a great idea, the first question they say is who needs it? They say, aha, uh -huh, just talk to this industry, they need it. And the second question, do they have money to pay for it? And the audience got lots of money to pay for it. So that's the process. But as far as ideas, they don't have to have a non-problem. Like, 
Einstein with relativity, nobody was bothered by the fact that you know, the space can be chaotic. <laughs> 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 he, he, he solved the problem which nobody had. And there's many, many other examples. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes. Hi, so I'm from Asia. So you briefly touched about this like initially, so I'm curious whether you think there's a big difference between like work ethics in the East versus the West and how that impacts like engineering design. Well, I mean there is a difference and we have to face it, we have to be realistic, because the culture of the new generation in the West is all about lifestyle. Okay? Because, you know, they, everybody wants to walk hard, but they believe and they like to ski and this. <laughs> work isn't like number one priority. And you can't change it. And there's no point saying, I'll start a company, everybody will work day and night, and everybody will be rich. And there's no point in saying it, because you're not going to find them, the people who want to do that. Now, in developing countries, uh, people work much harder there, because they can see the dramatic improvement it will do to their lifestyle. So if you come to a country and you know you barely have food and you work harder and suddenly you have food, that's much more tangible than here you buy a nicer iPhone. <laughs> so, so that's the difference and, and you have to be realistic. I mean, you, you cannot, and, and you know, the intelligence is equally distributed. So it's not that we are any smarter, everybody has the same distribution intelligence. Maybe we have a more daring culture taking risk, which helps. The culture of the West is more risk oriented daring. But in terms of developing products and manufacturing them, you have to take it into account in your plans that these days that people will walk day and night and you know do everything to succeed in the company, it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, Rapidia is my number six startup, <laughs> and every company people work a bit less. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you have to find something you can succeed if people work less. Because the idea is not to work hard, the idea is to succeed. But it's, it's harder to find something you can succeed with without anybody working overtime. <laughs> And the culture today is it's a lifestyle culture. Okay, so you have to take it into your plans. Okay, there's nothing else I can say. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means to be realistic. Don't expect people will walk through the night to be dead right? It's nice weather and we take off. <laughs> so, I, I'm so surprised by that too, but you know, you can't change the world. And I can see it, Rapidia is very good people, but they don't work the same amount of hours as people with Creo work. Okay, so what can you do? But the people are very smart, and hopefully it will be a success without overtime. <laughs> okay, last question. Yes. Um, so, as you mentioned earlier, I want to ask a question about like, coming up with ideas. And you mentioned like it's good to have like a lot of knowledge in a lot of different fields and combine them. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious if there are any books that you've read that kind of you know encompass these ideas of you know being creative and encompassing like different principles in different fields. Just something to kind of get your your creative juices flowing. I think you have to know what interests you. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's many books about how to be inventive, how to be creative, how to be the manager. It's a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read a book like this which was more than five minutes. Because you know, it's just usually people who wrote these books are not creative at all. It's need to make a living. Because <laughs> wrote books about how to manage, how to succeed, how to make money. These are not the people who succeeded on it. <laughs> 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 I mean, you have to you have to find out what will get you excited because you know I, I, I used to tell my employees you know if you don't think about it when you shower you are on the wrong feet because if you have to be in something which is on your mind all the time then you have ideas but if you come to work and before work you don't think about anything related to work you do your honest job eight hours you come home and never think about it again. 
you do an okay job, but you wouldn't be an inventor or you wouldn't be very successful because you have to be obsessed with the subject. So it's very difficult. I mean, how do I know what will I be obsessed with? <laughs> so you have to kind of look around and there's a few tests for that. One test for that, if you were independently wealthy, you didn't need the money, what will you do with your time? And if you think, if I was independently wealthy, I'll make a lab and raise bees. Ah, you should go into bee research. <laughs> so that's some of the tests. But uh, you have to find, even if you don't have any passion for anything right now, you have to look around and say, what has a chance to get me into this? And then you'll we'll succeed. And unless it's a field which nobody is willing to pay for. I'm talking about technology. If you are interested in poetry, it's a nice hobby. <laughs> <laughs> but in technology, let's see what we need to do. And don't listen to any advice. And you'll find it. You'll slowly find it. Okay, I think my time is up. Thank you.